Um, my name is Dr. Dickon Bevington. I'm what they call a consultant in child and adolescent psychiatry. So that means I'm a medical doctor. Um, I used to do bones and stomachs and I sort of got bored with them and got more interested in people who had worries of one sort or another and as you know that's a branch of medicine called psychiatry. So I trained as a psychiatrist in London and then I focused a little bit more on working with children and young people and now I specialise just really in what we call adolescence, I guess from about the age of 12, 13 up to 18 or 19. And I work with uh, Liz, who's uh, just off screen because she's far too shy to uh, be on screen, but uh, if you'd like to say hello, Liz. Hi. <laughs> and um, so Liz and I work with a team called the Cambridgeshire Adolescent Substance Use Service, or CASUS, and um, we work across the whole of Cambridgeshire with young people who've got themselves, I guess, into one or other kind of problem with the substances they've used or are using. And sometimes they just want some advice and some information, and sometimes we have to be much more actively involved in helping them. Uh, so that's the sort of experience that we have, and Liz and I are going to try and talk to you a little bit today about cannabis. Dickon, can you just start by talking a little bit about what we know about how young people at the moment are using cannabis? Yeah, there's, so there's really three um, important um, points to think about that. People are using cannabis at a younger age than ever before. The cannabis that they're using is um, stronger than it has ever been before, and they're using more of it than ever before. But that's particularly young people compared to the whole population of the world, where actually the whole population of the world, the amount is actually probably going down a little bit, which is interesting, but in young people it's going up. Mm. Um, there are also some really important differences in the kind of cannabis. So I said it was stronger than it was. And that's about the balance between two ingredients in cannabis. So one ingredient is the ingredient that kind of gets people, if you like, a bit out of it. And that's what's called THC, or the full name is tetrahydrocannabinol. And so THC makes you feel uh, very out of it, can make um, you feel quite paranoid at times, but it's certainly what gives people the sort of buzz and the high um, of cannabis. But if you take too much, it can actually be it's what we call a hallucinogen. It can make you see things or hear things that, you, that are not really there or believe things so that everybody else could see are clearly not true. So THC is both what gives cannabis its main strength, but it's also the, probably the most risky part of it. And the other ingredient is stuff called cannabidiol, which actually, if anything, is kind of a calmer downing agent. It kind of settles people. And there's some interest in using that as a medicine eventually, maybe in five years' time or ten years' time. And what's happened is the, the balance between these two has changed a lot. So it's gone from, in maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, kind of some, some THC and a fairly good whack of cannabidiol to, more recently, almost all THC and almost no cannabidiol at all. And that's a huge difference and that's shown by this guy Potter who looked at a whole load of specimens of cannabis that had been stored in deep freezes for the last 10 or 15 years from where police made seizures and they've always kept a sample of it. And that's a really important paper that has definitely shown that the amount of THC has gone from being kind of more or less imbalanced to being kind of completely different. And what's kind of interesting too is that there's another study that shows that actually if you give people cannabis in different mixtures, lots of THC and very little cannabidiol, or a kind of good balance, in fact, and if they don't know what they're getting, people who are getting the more balanced stuff actually describe much more enjoyment than this, which actually makes people quite anxious and a bit paranoid. And that really fits, as I'm sure you'll agree, Liz, with mm -hmm. our experience of young people who have been using, you know, really a lot of cannabis, and particularly this high THC cannabis, that they mm -hmm. can make them very anxious and angry and paranoid yeah. um, in a way that perhaps the sort of old-fashioned view of cannabis as you know, kind of pretty mm -hmm. mellow and calming. It definitely is a different, is a different effect on the human brain. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another big change. Okay. Okay, so you're saying that there's more cannabis out there 
nowadays it's available for young people and that the cannabis that is out there is stronger. What is it about what's going on during adolescence that makes that particularly worrying? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's the really, that's the $60,000 question. Mm. Why are we worried about this happening in an adolescent brain? Because the cannabis that goes elsewhere in your body, as far as we know, is, is not so problematic. It can cause, we think, cancers in the lung if you smoke it, but that may just be because it's mixed with tobacco a lot. Mm. But the, um, the cannabis that's getting into the adolescent brain, the reason we're getting really worried about is that actually until maybe the last 10, 12 years, we really didn't understand what was going on in the adolescent brain at all. In fact, 10, 12 years ago, we thought that pretty much by the time you reached the age of 11 or 12, that was it. Your brain was kind of formed and um, it was all done. And it's only since we've got these really kind of amazing scans that we can make pictures of what's going on in the brain that... I mean, even when I started doing medicine, I couldn't dream of having the kind of pictures that we can get of a young person's brain. Um, so it's only since then that we've begun to realise that there's a, a huge amount of really, really important um, organisation going on in the adolescent's brain. Okay, so we've just cut so that I can just show you this slide, and um, my apologies if this is starting to look awfully like a science lesson, um, which I guess it is really. Um, so here's a graph, and um, up here, we've got the level of functioning, that's, I, I, that's the, the, the number of things that your brain can do. And of course, as you get older, you expect it to be able to do some extra things over and above what it could do when you were in your um, very early years. And then along the bottom here, you've got your age. So at 10, at 15, at 20, at 25, and going on, and when you get off the scale, you get close to, to my age. <laughs> okay, so what's happening normally is that your brain is kind of whizzing along, there's lots of development happening and it's getting more and more levels of functioning and then eventually it gets to, you know, pretty much as good as it gets when you get to be my, my age, it's starting to kind of fall off the end again and I'm losing functions, but you're still gaining them. So early on, this is happening to each nerve cell in your brain. Each nerve cell is branching and then from a branch another branch comes and from that branch another branch comes and then from that branch another branch. And there's a wonderful fact, and it's probably not entirely true, but it should be true if it isn't, which is that by the time you reach your mid-childhood, about eight or nine, there are more joins between these little fingers, which we call synapses. There are more of those than there are stars in the universe. So even if it's not entirely true, it's kind of worth thinking about. There's an unimaginably large number of these connections. And then, and this is what we didn't know until really quite recently, things go completely into reverse. I'm going to just press the button on my computer to make it do that. So this starts happening. We have this thing called pruning. The synapses, the joins between these little fingers, they start falling off. Okay? And the big question is that... Whilst that's that really starts to happen fast in adolescence, that is what's happening. You are shedding these kind of branches of these trees big time, fast. And why are we doing that? Well, you're shedding branches that your, your brain isn't using. So what you're shedding are any pathways through your brain that you're just kind of, you know, are not, are not being activated quickly. And that means that by the time you reach your kind of early 20s, the motorways in your brain have been sort of laid down. That's what you've got. And at the end of the day, once you're in your early 20s, there's not a lot more room to kind of open up whole new routes through. 